Hello. Um, thank you very, very much for having me here. I'm really feeling very honored to be invited here um, as a discussant. However, I have to say, uh, I hope I give justice to all the three presentations because I'm an anthropologist by training and come from a completely different uh, field. Uh, nevertheless, I feel that we had here three very exciting and mind-expanding uh, um, uh, inputs, papers, um, and I'm very happy to um, carve out a number, three, four uh, issues I would like to discuss where, we, where I would try to uh, bring the three um, presentations um, uh, in connection with each other. The first, I think, what we have always to consider is um, this strong narrative uh, we have uh, on climate change and its uh, negative repercussion impacts uh, on society. And I think this is a um, narrative which is very strong in our mind. Uh, which we all more or less believe. I think uh, Tim Basley uh, in the morning keynote, he also um, mentioned this again, that this is particular for academics, something we always have in mind. The interesting fact is that we hardly, if we then change to research, we hardly see uh, that uh, we can observe this in research. Or put differently, what we observe in uh, research is that the data does, us not, does, does us not provide us uh, with um, the evidence that climate change um, have, has on, um, uh, on, on conflicts or ne negative uh, uh, repercussions in uh, society. And the reasons, therefore, are manifold. Uh, and we see this very often. There's uh, one researcher who is making the, uh, one argument, and the other one is coming directly with the counter-argument. Um, I think one issue is, particularly if we're talking about conflict-prone countries, is uh, that we ha have hardly data uh, of uh, really uh, the countries where we see violent conflicts. It's not by accident that uh, 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 Gracia mentioned that you're doing field work in the Philippines, Kenya, Senegal. They're always the typical countries where we are working. But what about countries like Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Somalia? You mentioned Somalia, I think was, was really brilliant. South Sudan. For most of these countries, we have hardly have any data. So I think we have uh, directly the main, one of the, our main problems is that we, for most of the uh, uh, conflict, uh, violent conflict countries, the data uh, is missing, particularly if you're then thinking about uh, field research in, in these countries. Second, also mentioned by Gracia, I think uh, that we have uh, a high complexity of factors, this non-linearity and this strong contextualization uh, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, conflicts, which it makes it very difficult to understand uh, what has really an impact um, on conflict situations. Uh, if you just uh, read the paper um, by Catherine March of 2019, she shows uh, that it's all about poor development and bad governance and that climate change hardly has any impact on, um, on conflict situations. So it depends very much on which, uh, 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 on, uh, which uh, indicators you are using, uh, which var var variables you are using to understand here's the complexity. And of course, climate change is a long-term process uh, which we hardly can, um, where we can hardly understand the impacts if we have a short-term processes of a violent conflict of about eight to 10 years. So this is, I think, one problem uh, we are facing here. And this brings me, of course, to the uh, very um, uh, stimulating and also perhaps provocative uh, talk of uh, Marco and Gabriel. Thank you very much for your uh, paper, which just shows, uh, tries us to show this uh, direct correlation. I think it was really very fascinating. Uh, but of course, it's also um, uh, directly provokes a kind of um, um, uh, uh, of objection. I think uh, 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 that uh, Marco, you're also somehow looking for these questions about uh, where it works and where not. Um, and uh, uh, of course, you're just thinking about countries, case studies where it's not working, where it's working. And I think this is something um, I'm sure that some of you will come back with your own cases um, in mind. I was also asking my question, you followed more kind of a relational um, um, approach of the uh, average deviations uh, um, um, uh, of temperature. And I ask myself to what extent you can identify certain tipping points. You can really say 
um, that, uh, let's say, beyond 35 degrees or so on, um, you have uh, changes. Um, and of course, I think there will be the main critique of a kind of a deterministic view. And um, uh, I, I think that this will be really um, something where particular, if you're just following more my anthropological view, you have then um, case studies uh, very much on the local level, which will come up with another uh, with another um, uh, with other results, but doesn't mean that yeah, that your research is um, is not right. Um, second point I would like to make is that I find it very fascinating. Although scrolling through the three papers here is the question of terminology. On the one side we are talking about climate change, and on the other side we are often talking about conflict, about security, about peace. But these are three completely different terms, and I think we have really to understand what we are talking about, and I would like to unpack uh, the three uh, terms in the next uh, five minutes, because I think uh, that this really matters. Um, if you talk about uh, conflicts, uh, the main argument is that natural uh, resource scarcity leads to more conflicts. I think this is the overall idea we always uh, have in mind, in particular that climate shocks, droughts, uh, floods, uh, and so on uh, lead, to, uh, lead to conflict. This is also what you try, uh, Garcia, to show in your uh, studies. And of course, what we see is that particularly on the communal level, on the local levels, uh, countries which are exposed uh, to drastic climate change are the ones where we see most of the violent conflict. So this could be an argument um, um, which would uh, uh, bolster the idea of this uh, interconnection between climate change and, and conflict. However, there are also many, many counter examples. And this is particularly that uh, with resource scarcity, we observe uh, a much stronger cooperation. We'll just give you an example from my own research in northern uh, Kenya, where I'm doing studies on pastoralism. And in northern Kenya, it's the same with Somalia, we observed now extensive droughts for the, for the last three years. And what we can observe there is that the cattle rate, the cattle rustling, is dropping down over the, the last three years. Because, and this is the main form of violence you can observe here. The reason is that you, uh, in uh, times of drought, uh, you are, the, the pastoralists are starting to share um, their, their, their pastures, are cooperating together, because you, if you have uh, cattle uh, uh, which, uh, which, which are under poor conditions, you can, you, uh, they are even more a burden uh, than you can can sell them or do something with them. So there we can observe that only in rainy seasons uh, the cattle rates are increasing uh, because um, uh, then the cattle uh, are made of uh, use for the communities. So here this is more or less the opposite, that more or less uh, in situations of droughts, the conflicts or the violence um, is dropping. And I think there are many arguments, particularly if you're really focusing on the local levels, where you see uh, that uh, our ideas we have in mind uh, with uh, climate shocks that uh, the opposite um, observes. Let me come to the second term, uh, security. I think um, here, I think we have to be very clear about, about what we are talking, because uh, security is a very um, uh, uh, vague uh, term. And I think uh, what I learned here, it's important to differentiate between this kind of everyday communal, local security. You can go back to all this uh, nice livelihood approaches on the one side, and on the other side, the national, international security debate we have. Um, and uh, for sure what we can observe currently is um, um, a circuitization of the climate change debate. And hereby that it becomes a very strong part of a national agenda, international agenda. And if you follow my argument on conflicts, where we talk about um, cooperation, what we see currently in the circuitization debate is um, a separation, um, that, uh, that uh, national interests are coupled uh, with uh, the idea of climate change. So it's not about cooperation. So more or less a fueling uh, of conflicts uh, uh, as soon as um, climate change uh, enters the, the security or the national security uh, debate. Interesting enough is that we observe in the climate change, de change uh, debate that security uh, becomes increasingly important. This was very fascinated, Emily, by your talk using the term of uh, soft security. 
Uh, you could also think about why not using the term of peace, but you brought in the term of uh, soft security, which reminded me about the debate 20 years ago or 25 years ago on human security. It's the idea somehow to widen the security approach to expand security beyond hard security, and on the other side, to, to keep uh, the balance between the nice, shiny, soft human, soft uh, human uh, idea, and on the other side, the hard uh, security, and to bring both debates uh, together. But I think we have to be really very um, um, serious about to what extent uh, this uh, works out in the end or to what extent uh, you, um, uh, you, you bring together two debates which should be separated. I think it's more or less an open question. The final one is, of course, uh, on uh, peace. And of course, we have a lot of debate on environmental uh, peace building. Uh, and I think here again, as Emily has, has shown us, the whole idea of cooperation and trust uh, is uh, here key. But I think you also addressed rightly the question, how serious are we about this process? How serious are we about that we uh, create an environment uh, where this kind of peace building can take place? Again, some examples of my research uh, from Kenya, uh, where I did a lot of research on the um, uh, on NRT, the Northern uh, Rangeland uh, Trust Fund. It's a, it's a huge NGO with a high number of conservancies where they tried to bridge um, um, uh, environmental peacemaker with uh, environmental peacemaking uh, with uh, conservancy um, issues. What we see there is that in some areas, uh, a peace building approach between uh, different um, communities works that here pastoralists are brought uh, together. We see, but we also see the opposite. We see many areas where um, the uh, NRT is fueling existing conflicts and where we even see a militarization uh, of conflicts. So I think we can see both. So I think it's very difficult here to really to say uh, that peace building works um, uh, in the one or the other way, or put in a nutshell, not always all good things are uh, coming along um, together. I uh, will uh, uh, leave it here. I'm really looking forward for this debate. And John, I think it's now your turn to take over. Thank you very much. Uh, so everyone, uh, you've heard from our speakers, you've heard from our discussant, and now we would like to hear from you. So it's time to have some questions. What we'll do, I think, as the norm I gather is we're going to pick one side of the room and work our way across. Usually we seem to start on that side, which seems a little mean. So this time we'll start over here and we'll start with the gentleman at the back, the gentleman in the middle, and then the gentleman at the, the front for the first round. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very exciting presentations. My question would be for Marco. So to examine whether you tested if your models hold, if instead of the deviation from the monthly temperature, you do it for the deviation from the weekly or biweekly to week temperature. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Daryl Sequeira. Um, referring to the second speaker, uh, which who related um, rise in temperature to rise of intention to disagree or become more conflict-ridden. I was a bit sort of concerned about this relationship <laughs> between the two, because actually what we are measuring, it seems to me, and I, I'm not a psychologist, but what it seems we're really measuring is the psychological status of the community when the temperature rises, right? And so, of course, I know from personal experience, when it's hot, you tend to get a little bit more irritated and so on, you know? And the first thing is you might fight with your close relatives or friends, right? But then you make up later on and you put it down to heat. But actually, uh, 
the, the consequence, which apparently is seen to be as due to a temperature rise, is actually a, a change in psychological status of the person. And that is brought about by several factors, in my opinion. So, for example, when you talk about the impact of climate change, we might only look at temperature, but what we're also seem what we ought to be also be considering is that in these arid areas that we talk about, for example, in Africa and other parts of the world, uh, we are actually at the moment at the point where there has been an accumulated impact of misuse of land, deforestation, overgrazing, overpopulation of livestock, uh, and so on, o o overpopulation of people, I mean, and also of livestock and so on. And so the consequence has been that partly due to this as, um, mentality of humans, even in rainforest and better forested areas, climate change and of course the use of fossil fuel and so on, uh, climate change has come about. And the places where it is impacting most is in the more marginal and arid areas of the planet. Uh, but I'm even Sorry in the to cut you off, but that you, is that, that's actually in itself an excellent question. So maybe we'll move to the, the third question, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Watson. I'm from University of Sussex and ACLED as well. Uh, so I noticed the first couple of speakers used ACLED data. I do want to put a cautionary note that we would not support claims about climate change and conflict or climate change and riots being closely related. We do not see that in, in the evidence. So I need to put that out there first. Um, so I think I'm, I'm a bit, I would like to echo some of, some of Conrad's comments. Um, so it seemed like you guys were using quite a Malthusian perspective to understand the relationship between climate and conflict, generally building on Thomas Malthus's largely discredited ideas about environmental degradation leading to scarcity, leading to population movement or migration as we call it today, and societal collapse. Now that has, at the time, did not have much evidence to support it. It doesn't have much evidence now. And I would, again, add some caution. I just want to make a couple of comments, uh, if I may. So, Marco, on the, some of the accounts, you're building on a tradition of research where there was some researcher says that when it rains less in Africa and Africans get hotter, they fight more. And this has often been interpreted as quite racist. Um, I would be quite cautious about having this kind of biological determinism argument for, for riots, particularly because in Africa, the reason there's a, a deficit of trust can be for a whole host of factors. Economic volatility at the moment, uh, democratic reversal and rise in coups can be some of those reasons. I'm aware that I'm probably over time, so uh, if there's another round, I'll be able, I might ask another one. Thank you. So looking at this first set of questions, uh, Marco, it looks like you're clearly on the hot seat. <laughs> but one of the things that comes up in our third question is this notion of, in some sense, responsiveness to uh, climatic shocks in terms of how institutions might adapt or change in ways which might either exacerbate these climatic events or mitigate these. And I think, uh, Grazia, you and Emeli actually had, in some sense, gave us different examples of those. So I will let Marco go first. And then if you guys wouldn't mind speaking to the last point, that would be very helpful. OK. Um, Thank you so much uh, for super interesting questions, really wrecking my brain whilst you were talking to come up with something smart to say about them. About the weekly temperature anomalies, that's a great point. No, we haven't done that. That's relatively easy to do. My guess would be that the results should be relatively stable just because, so for example now, like the average temperature in the first week of May is relatively similar to the average temperature in the second week of May. So in that sense, you wouldn't find m massive temperature changes from one week to the other. But that's definitely something that we could look at. We haven't looked at that yet. So it's a great point. Thank you. Um, sorry, best thing I can say is we will look at that. <laughs> <laughs> then the second point, sorry, I was writing, I wasn't checking the newspaper. <laughs> I was actually writing down. About the psychological status, yes. Um, yeah, that is, unfortunately, it's kind of a trade-off because we really... I think it's, it's a discipline thing. I think economists, we just care a lot about kind of the identification of causal effects. That's kind of the, what, makes, what makes us 
happy and what, uh, what we are respected for, kind of. That's where the literature is going. So in that sense, I think I'm guilty of trying to please the masses. So there's a clear trade-off of kind of looking at short-term deviations, which I think you're right. I mean, they, in a certain way, there's, it's really hard to generalize. I mean, does a one day, just because one day it's hotter, does that necessarily mean that long-term climate change will do that? I don't know. So in that sense, it's, it's a trade-off. But on the other hand, if we're looking at long-run temperature changes, then, then it would be very hard to disentangle kind of the pure effect of climate of anything that you said, like operating via institutions, etc. So I think we just came down, we prefer the not being able to necessarily generalize it for the long term, but we are pretty confident that we can identify temperature change. The other thing I thought was an excellent point was maybe to distinguish between um, <clears throat> kind of areas like arid areas or areas where there's been misuse. Um, I think in the protest data, we could, it would be really interesting to do that. So one thing we did is we looked at kind of cells. It's about 100 by 100 kilometers. And we overlaid those with uh, kind of GDP of the country. And we found that the effect of temperature is much stronger on protests if the country is poor. So which kind of really fits with the attitudinal stuff. Plus, the other thing, we overlaid it with some sort of ethnicity maps. And the effect is much stronger if more than one ethnicity lives in that cell, so which you kind of think those are the cells where conflict might be more likely to arise. But uh, I think your suggestion could be done very easily by looking at kind of how arid the land is. So um, again, great points. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dan. And I come from University of Sussex as well, so great to see yeah. colleagues. <laughs> um, all right, um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you on, on your point uh, in the sense that we, we, we don't claim that climate is a direct impact on conflict. Uh, there's been quite a lot of attempts and literature, I mean, quite, quite few, few very, very good scholars have ever tried and attempted to find a direct link, causal link between climate and conflict. But, but, but our, our assumption and our point of departure is that we, we, we we assume, we, we think that climate has a role in this nexus. We know very clearly, I mean, CGR has been studying this for, uh, I don't know, 50 years, that climate has an impact on the socioeconomic systems, on food insecurity, socioeconomic uh, risks and insecurities that are fundamentally, this is the other part of the literature, uh, recognized as drivers of conflict. We know that there is a connection between food insecurity, forced migration, inequality, and the security side of the stories. How do we put these two th things together? Uh, to, together? Uh, there is inevitably a, a question, a research question there in understanding whether climate is a threat multiplier that could really increase the, 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 the likelihood of conflict that we find evidence for that. There is also a question of data. Um, you know, the, 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 the usual suspects of the data that we've been using uh, are um, extracted from, from, from different sources. We can I mean, be at the session just now thinking about how, how accurate and how relevant are, are some sorts of data, some type of data for the type of research questions that we ask. So we, we should definitely improve on that in trying to find small scale type of tensions and conflict that no, don't necessarily end up in fatalities or they don't end up in larger scale conflicts that are more related to natural resources uh, aspects. And then there are situations in where, where uh, um, climate and conflict are not related. Uh, I mean, at, at least we don't see the, the, the relations. In Sahel, for instance, that there has been quite, uh, um, the, Sahel has always been exposed to, to, to conflict, uh, always been expo exposed to climate impacts, but not every drought leads to conflict. So what are these mitigating factors? And one mistake that we should really avoid it, and that we, we are trying to, to really push for this message is that we cannot really only rely on what the data are telling us. Uh, the, 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 what what the, they could tell us is that there's climate exposure in one area, but then conflict happen uh, kilometers away from that. So there is high uh, heterogeneity in terms of the occurrence of these two different but very, very important phenomena. So we need to really integrate and use our best methods and approaches to integrate qualitative and quantitative type of uh, approaches. And, um, and, and, and also, we need to consider the other aspects. So some specific contextual factors that could mitigate the, the, the impact of climate and conflict. And as I said, not every 
country, drought leads to conflict in different areas. So instead of looking for generalizable uh, statement, external validity of this research, probably this, this is the, the case, this type of research, where we don't want to do that. We want to be as contextual as possible, as localized as possible, as, as, as Conrad was saying in, the, in, in Kenya, in some instances, peace building strategy work. In some other instances, maybe the next village, this don't work. That doesn't mean that climate doesn't exist or conflict don't, do not exist. And also the final point on the importance of the risk of conflict. Um, even if we don't observe conflict, it doesn't mean that the risk of conflict doesn't exist. And in fact, in, in the previous session, uh, the, the panel discussion, uh, suddenly was saying that Rather than focusing on the incidence and number of conflict, we should look at, at the propensity, at the, at the risk of, of tensions of conflict occurring. There are situations where uh, areas where they are controlled by armed group and they're relatively peaceful, but it doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, they are actually, there, there is peace, that there will be peace forever. So these are my points. Thanks. Thank you. Well, would you like to add? Yeah. Yes, it's what I would like to also comment here is relation to these risks of the conflicts. Because like, for example, Europe now, the psychologists, they are working with the, with the together with the youth researchers, because what they have recognized is that when the youth, for example, uh, they are so concerned now in Europe that what is the future? What is gonna be the day future? What is the future opportunities? And, and that actually creates the risk. That creates the risk of the conflicts, but it's, it's, it's also health risk, it's also the risk for our education system, and so on and so. And, and these type of climate-related risks, we also need to understand that those are not necessarily the conflicts now, now, but if the youth, for example, they do not believe that they have a future. It creates the various type of risks in our society. Thank you. So we have uh, time for a second round. We'll start in the middle here. And I think we'll do the gentleman in the blue sh uh, shirt, the uh, lady behind you, and then we'll go to the back of the room. Hi, I'm Rodrigo Oliveira from Unwider. Uh, thank you for the great presentations. I have two questions for Marco. So, Marco, the first one is, um, why don't you present or estimate results comparing instead of the difference between the average uh, temperature? Um, why don't you look to the standard deviation? So the, the, the deviation from the historical average, what I mean? Because um, most of the papers in the uh, rainfall literature look to this measure. And I think uh, what this literature try to find or try to investigate are um, extreme events, right? So I'm not sure if, if when you look to one, two, three degrees from the historical average is in fact an extreme uh, event. Um, but if you look to, yeah, to the deviation from the historical, and you can look to one or two or three standard deviations, you can have, a, in my opinion, better measure. And the second one is about the country level analysis, because, for example, just taking one country, Mozambique, for example, this is uh, two, more than 2,000 uh, long kilometers uh, country. So do you have any information or any analysis about the subnational level? Because uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to uh, uh, believe that the, there will be an, an effect in votes for all the country. But if you have uh, data for subnational levels and changes in the temperature at the subnational levels and also for election data, maybe this can help in, 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 pre in presenting this. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Margherita Scorcina from New, the University of Florence. Thank you so much for the presentation, very interesting. And I have a few questions uh, for Grazia, uh, to, uh, to Grazia. Um, I really like the framework that you used. And I was wondering why you used the DHS data, uh, because we know that they are, uh, they, they are cross-sectional data. So I was wondering why instead of like uh, some other 
um, longitudinal data, for, for instance, uh, LSMS data. And also, if you um, look at, if you think there could be some selection bias, because uh, like we know that in uh, conflict, in areas where there are conflict, uh, it's more difficult to collect data. So maybe there, this could uh, create some selection bias. And also, if you look at the um, immediate effect versus long-term effects of climate change on uh, on conflict. And the last uh, last point, uh, if you also uh, compare like ongoing ongoing conflicts versus uh, new conflicts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jackson uh, from Conflict Research Network, uh, West Africa. Uh, I want to find out, in as much as I understand uh, uh, the fact that the literature argues uh, conflict, uh, climate change is, uh, has a multiplier effect on, on conflict, and you had uh, data, on, data sets on Nigeria. Uh, in the case of Nigeria, where we have multiple drivers of conflict, uh, for instance, ethnic conflict, uh, political conflict, as well as, as, well as a national, national resource-based uh, conflict. And uh, the data on temperature and, and the incidences of, of, of conflict. Um, I'm a bit worried. Uh, so at what point uh, would you tell if uh, the occurrences of conflict during the hot period uh, is because it's climate change? Uh, reason being that, uh, did you collect data when temperature was cold to compare when the temperature was hot? Uh, because in Nigeria, we have lots of conflicts and crises all year long, you know, from the northeast to the northwest to north central to southeast and, and south south. And these conflicts are uh, ethnic, uh, religious, uh, uh, political. Uh, uh, protest and, and, and it goes on all, all year long. So how do we know it's because of climate change? Thank you. Great. So I think we'll give Marco a little extra time to work out some answers to these questions. So Grazia, would you mind going first? Thank you. Yeah, th thanks a lot. Thanks, Margarita, for the great, great questions. Um, we actually use on the data, uh, DHS data, so we, we, both, we use both DHS and LSMS data, depending on the country. Obviously, LSMS is not available for the countries. I know that, that we have also LSMS for Nigeria, so we've done the analysis for LSMS data, and it's, it's pretty much consistent, so we find, we find similar, um, similar um, uh, evidence, with the advantage of having uh, the agricultural production also in the LSMS. SMS, so we also add another layer of the analysis to that. So that's that's a great point. Um, uh, in terms of, of the uh, selection bias, um, so it's more difficult to to collect data in conflict-affected areas and so on. I mean, yes, absolutely, there could there could be, but uh, um, we are looking at. Uh, um, slightly different types of conflict that might not really affect the, the, the collection of this type of data. So we're looking at small-scale conflict that, that, that really re re reflect the, um, the, 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 the relationship between groups that are affected by natural resource scarcities or related and food security. So we don't, we, we don't really look at countries where there is civil war or et cetera, which, which is something that we are going to do, uh, by the way, uh, with the new initiative that will be launched the next year, so looking at the Afghanistan and the, the Iraq potentially. I mean, we're still de de deciding, but but yeah, we, we we will be looking. But that is tricky. Yes, so we need to be innovative and creative in the way we we actually get the right data because at the end of the day, it's all it's all about which data we get. Um, we in our analysis, we look at we, we try to to to, to consider the the, the the temporal heterogeneity of these phenomena. So uh, we we consider the, the climate uh, anomalies, so the temperature and, and rainfalls that are happening uh, before other. Uh, um, indices uh, that are happen happening before the observations, before the interviews of the household. So the climate is sort of considered a previous lag, a lag minus one. Then for the conflict, we look at those conflicts that are happening uh, after uh, the um, 
uh, after the, the, the interviews, so in, in, in the quarter, on, uh, in the semester, or in the nine months after the, uh, the, 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 the household has been interviewed. And in order to, to also uh, compensate, sort of offset the fact that we don't have panel data in DHS, we use a system, we identify grids um, using a special, a special technique, special approach, so we identify grids within the country and then we sort of reconstruct uh, the, the panel uh, through that. Hope I've answered your question. Thanks a lot. Thank you for um, that, your question about the standard deviation versus the kind of level. Um, it is not something we've done. I know it's done a lot with rainfall because I think the standard deviation, rainfall is usually kind of the idea is that that affects agricultural outputs and then that might affect another thing. We, the reason why we just looked at levels because we kind of thought that our paper is already a bit, might be a little bit controversial. So we wanted to stick to the methodology that other people have used. So we kind of said everything like that grid, I actually downloaded that from another paper. Uh, the idea is that we try to replicate everything exactly like previous studies to kind of have a bit of a stronger argument. That being said, I think it would be really cool to look at whether the effect of kind of anomalies varies from kind of more volatile areas to non-volatile areas. That would be really cool kind of to distinguish Maybe it's stronger, you know, if you're already used to kind of changing climate, which might be answering a little bit your question as well, because you could combine these kind of short-term fluctuations with kind of longer-term trends. So I think that's a really cool um, uh, real possibility to do. By the way, we do include um, we do include rain as a as a variable. We find zero effect, which we've actually found pretty reassuring because we're really trying to measure this kind of direct effect. About the subnational level. The, it's, uh, <clears throat> so we have two research assistants that worked a lot to digitize all the data, and it was so much work just to do it on the country level. So if we did, actually the data are there for sub kind of county level. Um, so it's, I think it took them already two months, so I think it would have taken them a year, and the idea is that this is not really a paper only on elections, but it's just a thing, but I have to say, I'm not going to tell this to my two research assistants. <laughs> Apparently, these data already exist. So <laughs> I think they did everything uh, which was already there. But I, I'll definitely have a look because you're right. And so it's just a broad brush. The idea was that the main analysis is on, is on uh, intentions to vote, and it's just corroborating it with some sort of incidences. But thank you. It's a great idea. So let's see if we have. Yes, the, this is proposal for for rather for for you. Then, then it's actually once we talk about the risk and climate change, there is the one more layer of the risk and possible conflicts, because once there is a lot of now the funding directly, for example, the climate mitigation actions, but also the offsetting. Uh, these, like a lot of political scientists, but also the studies related to political ecology, it's also concerned that what type of conflicts, what type of risk, these type of mitigation actions, offsetting actions, because these are also changing the political setting. These are also the relation to uh, land use. These are also related to ethnicity. And it's actually the same time once we try to do the offsetting and, and through the, also the donor agencies try to do to carry out the mitigation actions in various countries, we actually can cause the more conflicts. We can also be the, be the quite hush throughout these the blueprint projects to the local realities. So maybe that could be the one layer in your, your studies which could be actually uh, integrated there. Yeah, thank, thanks for this. In fact, I mean, one of the, the main challenges that we have in researching on this climate security nexus is actually the research gap that we want to, to fill is, 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 is precisely this. So we are aware that climate adaptation and mitigation can create maladaptation. Mm -hmm. So really affecting all those potential drivers of, of conflict. So what do we do about that? So we really need to make sure that our climate action becomes sensitive 
to, to conflict, mm -hmm. to peace and security, and, and really embracing these concepts whenever we design the, the way we design the, the climate action. And really make, making sure that we don't really change the, the equilibrium, the balance, or we don't, we don't do harm. Uh, and in fact, I mean, the objective should be that uh, whilst we, we want to increase climate resilience, we should also be able to contribute to stability. And, and this is uh, quite straightforward in, in thinking about it, because if we don't, you don't have stability and fragility in the countries where we work on, then we can't really uh, achieve climate resilience. So there has to be a combination of both. Thanks. So I would love to take more questions, but I've already been shown the yellow time card. And for those of you who are football fans, will know that once you get a yellow card, a red card is often not that far behind. So I want to end by with two points, one of which is that one of the things I really liked about this session were the deep complementarities that existed between what at surface looked like very disparate presentations. I think starting off with Grazia's presentation, emphasizing the notion of how complicated these linkages are. Oftentimes, in, particularly in the popular press, the argument seem to go is that climate change will lead to conflict over resources, conflict over resor con access to resources, and that, that will then spill over to conflict. And I think what you did in a very nice way is to suggest that is actually, things are much more complex than that. Um, Marco then does, a, in effect, a deep dive on one of these mechanisms, and I thought the results which were particularly interesting were the results about trust the way in which, in fact, these extreme temperature events may make, it, may make pro social behavior more difficult, which is then has implications both for the likelihood of conflict, but also for the ability to negotiate conflicts over things like that access to resources, which then takes us very neatly into Ermele's uh, presentation, who talks about responses which could, we could develop to actually anticipate these potentially more conflictual environments in the future. And of course, this then leads back very nicely to some of the things we were talking about this morning in Tim Bisley's keynote address. So with all that, I would like to thank again all our panelists for their very rich presentations and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you.